Since 9-11, this country's desire for safety and security has given the U.S. government an unprecedented and unchecked amount of power. We've seen a crackdown on dissent that's unparalleled in recent history, including an outright assault on whistleblowers. Obama alone has already charged eight people with espionage under a law drafted during World War I that was designated for foreign spies. The latest to be charged, of course, is Edward Snowden, an American citizen who's revealed the extent of the NSA's spying apparatus. And although Snowden's story continues to make international headlines, other lesser known, lesser known whistleblowers over the years have also exposed disturbing aspects of the security state, one of which is Susan Lindauer, ex-CIA asset and author of the book Extreme Prejudice, the terrifying story of the Patriot Act and the cover-ups of 9-11 and Iraq. She's joining us now to talk about her experience whistleblowing about Iraq and 9-11 and also just the greater war on whistleblowers. Here she is. Susan, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's great to be with you. So you claim that you were indicted, not charged, but indicted under the Patriot Act. Can you break down the most simplest of terms for the audience? What happened to you? My story is a cautionary tale in this age of Edward Snowden and Julian Assange. Both of those men are very right to be afraid of the U.S. courts, and there are special considerations that Russia and Ecuador need to take into account when considering whether to grant asylum requests or whether to return them to the United States. And my case illustrates that. Uh, I was the chief CIA asset covering Iraq and Libya at the United Nations for, from 1995 to 2003. I gave advance warning about 9-11, and there was a peace option on the table with Iraq that the United States wanted to suppress. 30 days after I requested to testify on Capitol Hill, I went to Congress and requested to testify through proper channels. I woke to hear the FBI pounding on my door with an arrest warrant on the Patriot Act. And you were accused of accepting unsolicited bribes from Iraqi, yeah. uh, basically a spy for Iraqi intelligence, um, and that's incorrect. Th that was incorrect, but... Uh, that, that, is, that, that was incorrect information. There was no evidence to support it. So after the United States made the accusations, they uh, invoked the Patriot Act to deprive me of the right to a trial. They refused even to grant my request for a hearing. I was hit with secret charges, secret evidence, secret grand jury testimony. I was never allowed to know who had accused me of what crime. The government had no obligation to prove, provide any evidence that the crime ever occurred. But I was then, uh, in, 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 in the court of public opinion, I was already convicted. Of course, just like all these other whistleblowers that we're seeing today. Um, so let's talk about the warnings that you, that you tried to give about 9-11. Um, you said in April of 2001, you were actually told by, by someone higher up in the administration that about an imminent attack, I mean specific details here, World Trade Center hijacking of airplanes. What were you working on that you needed to know that information? I mean, you said that you were a CIA asset. I, I was the back channel. I was a covert back channel to the Iraqi embassy. And my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, instructed me to pass a message in April of 2001 to Iraqi diplomats and the Iraqi ambassador that the United States was seeking any fragment of intelligence regarding airplane hijackings and a known strike on the World Trade Center. And the threat or th that the United States was threatening war with Iraq in, at, from the highest levels of government, quote, and, and, and when you're back channel, it's very precise, quote, above the Secretary of State and above the CIA director. Now that's only three people, the President of the United States, the Vice President, and the Secretary of Defense. And that meant that all three of those individuals already knew about 9-11 in April of 2001. And we know now that there were, I mean, dozens of warning. It went well beyond the August 6 PDB that everyone talks about. I mean, we're talking about the light blinking red for months and months, yes. Susan. Um, what My question, I guess, if people knew specifics, I mean, we're talking about specifics, not just warning bin Laden, you know, and, attack and pending. Why didn't more people call out the government's total plea of incompetence after the fact? <laughs> well, what the government did was the government made a, uh, an example 
of those of us who knew the truth. And they said, if you if you cross the line, now I, I want to emphasize, I requested to testify through proper channels. I was a whistleblower, but I did it through Congress. I tried to do it through Congress. And, 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 and a, a lot of whistleblowers are citing my case as evidence that the going through the proper channels is not going to work and is not going to protect the public or the whistleblower. It, it, it makes no difference. If the government feels threatened, they will attack you, even if you're doing everything right. So why not make sure that the public has the information? So you're saying. If that you'd known about the Iraqi peace option, the whole world could have stopped the Iraq war. Well, of course. So, so and yeah, you were trying to uh, broker peace between Iraq as this liaison um, for the government. And so are you saying that the government purposefully allowed 9-11 to happen, made 9-11 happen? Yes. And that they were not Absolutely. interested in avoiding war with Iraq at They all. had already decided they were they, that if, if the 9-11 uh, conspiracy maximized damage on the towers, that there would be a perfect pretext for war. And they were overriding. Uh, Iraq's response to that was to invite the FBI to send a task force on terrorism into Baghdad with authorization to conduct a pre-9-11 investigation. Iraq said, if you think that there's evidence here, come get it. We want to help you because we want to preserve the peace option. Well, what's weird is why didn't they tell you to go uh, try to broker between Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan? I mean, they knew that bin Laden, I mean, bin Laden was involved in the PDB and the briefings. Why Iraq? It seems so non sequitur. Yeah, oh, exactly. There was no, and, and Saddam Hussein was one of our best sources on terrorism intelligence. Yeah. Throughout the 90s, Iraq was very afraid of the Islamic jihadis who might destabilize the secular regime and take advantage of the poverty caused by sanctions to try to bring about some Islamic revolution. So Saddam was very eager to help identify terrorist conspiracies, and he, he saw that as a strong point of his administration, that he could reach across the table and keep a line open to Washington, and that's what I existed to do. Because even under sanctions, we still had to protect national, international security from terrorist threat. In light of the, the recent NSA revelation, Susan, I mean, you yourself were subject to really harsh uh, crackdown from the government. I mean, even the author of the Patriot Act, though, he said that he never intended it to be used in the way that it is now. I mean, what do you think? When you're looking at everything that's happened over the last decade, did you foresee it ever getting to where it's gone and how pervasive it's become? I was the second non-Arab American ever indicted on the Patriot Act. And, and the Patriot Act has criminalized dissension. It says that sedition is uh, the, the act of opposing the government n through nonviolent means has become such a threat that free speech itself is now criminalized by the Patriot Act. And I think we're going to see the Patriot Act applied to many more people. Many, and, and many more situations that were never intended, but once the government gives itself power, it does not revoke its power, of ever. Course. And we're seeing now the Espionage Act, now eight people charging the Espionage Act. The great whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg said that Snowden's leak was the most important one in American history. Do you agree with that? Um, or do you think that there's a lot more that we're not being exposed well, to? Well, Edward Snowden is a t appears to be a tipping point, and I consider that to be very valuable. A lot of what Edward Snowden has revealed is already known to those of us inside the intelligence community, but it's not known by the wider public. And he has forced this issue into the public domain where ordinary Americans are now confronting the extreme surveillance that's going on. But I can tell you that for several years, um, within a 10-mile radius of every home in the United States in the most isolated rural areas, there is someone listening to your phone calls and reading your emails. And we've known this for a long time. And to wrap it up, we have about 30 seconds left, but given the enormous punishment that we are seeing on whistleblowers, why are you not treated the same as Kariaku, Manning, Snowden? And how are you able to sit <laughs> I, here and talk to me? I, I was held in prison on Carswell Air Force Base for a year. I was held under indictment for five years with no trial. I was forced to go into court with no attorney present to fight bail revocations that had no justification. Uh, I said, if you have evidence, convict me. You, you think you have evidence? I, I, demand to be present, I demand that you present it to a jury of my peers. They said, no way, because they didn't have any evidence. <laughs> there was nothing. Right. I never took money from the Iraqis. Well, thank you for coming on, sharing your story. Uh, definitely a really crazy time for whistleblowers, Susan. I'm glad that you're speaking out. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.